If you have your Bible, join me in Acts chapter 7. Last week, we were in Acts chapter 6, and Stephen had been selected as one of the early deacons, if you will, of the church. And there, in his role, he quickly moved into a place where he was doing signs and wonders. He had captured the attention of the religious leaders. They had brought him in, and they began to question him. So we come to chapter 7, where now Stephen begins to give his answer back to those who are questioning him about his faith and belief in Christ. Join me in verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Well, what things? Let's remind ourselves, go back to verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall deliver this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Did Jesus change everything? That's the question that is being now asked of Stephen. Stephen's answer goes back to even a lesson we learned last week, that scripture is its own defense. So Stephen begins his defense of Christ with biblical support. Join me in verse 2. Then he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon, and said unto him, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into his land or into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. This is great. What's happening here is as Stephen is beginning to give his defense of Christ, he's going all the way back to the beginning of their nation with Abraham. But in doing it, he's using events from their history, specifically now Abraham, and he's going to move into Moses. But he's using events to help the people understand that God works in ways that are predictable at times. And yet, in God's working, his timetable and our timetable are not the same. God keeps promises even if it is not on your timetable. God made a promise to Abraham. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a land that you can possess. And Stephen looks at the council and he says, the land that we're in, the land that you dwell in, was given to you by God and promised Abraham. It was promised to Abraham when he had no son to have a seed to inherit the land. And Abraham never got to the land. So the picture is that God made this promise to Abraham, and he kept his promise to Abraham. And this counsel was proof that God had kept his promise. But Abraham didn't see the fulfillment of that promise. On God's timetable, it worked. If you look at it from Abraham's point of view, it didn't. This was incredibly important because every one of these individuals sitting there, and even to this day, those that have a religious background of a Jewish nature believe in the Messiah, the one who is to come. So all Stephen is doing is saying, look, as much as God made a promise to Abraham that he would give him the land and he fulfilled that promise, God made a promise to us as a nation that he would send the Messiah, and he has kept that promise. He is getting to that point, but he is laying an incredible foundation to get them to think, you know what? Sometimes God does work, but not on the timetable that we think, but God always keeps his promises. Continue on with me, if you will. Look at verse 7. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. So he's talking about how they're going to end up in Egypt, verse 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him in the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt in Shadon, 
and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of promise drew nigh, which God has sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Here it is. The promise was made to Abraham, but there was a process that had to be taken place. And in this process, Joseph is sold into slavery, but God used that to deliver the entire nation, to protect them during this dearth, and to prepare them for the promised land. We see throughout these verses the providential hand of God. Stephen is wanting to remind these individuals that God was providentially working to protect his people, to give them the land that they were in. And God is providentially working to bring the Messiah. And he did, and it was Jesus. He's getting there, verse 18. Until another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the inn they might not live. In which time Moses was born, was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now, we are going to see a couple quick lessons about Moses here, and then we'll get back to the overall context. Verse 22, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Because of the account we have in the Old Testament, we know that when Moses is confronted by God to go back and deliver the people, Moses' response is, but I'm a man who's slow of tongue. I'm not able to go and to speak before Pharaoh. Well, here at this point in his life, 40 years prior to that moment, Moses is a man who has had an excellent education. He is mighty in words and deed. Moses had great human ability. We know because of the physical events that took place that he was physically strong. He kills a man with his bare hands. We know that he was intellectually capable and even in that sense of his charisma, his speech, his ability to persuade, he was extremely capable and he knew it. Look as we continue reading. And when he was full 40 years old. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For, verse 25, he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Moses, when he comes to this moment, Moses had faith in his own ability. Moses believed that God was going to deliver them by his hand. He knew how capable he was. He was trying to do it in his own strength. So many times we have great faith in our own ability. God has blessed us. He has given us talents. He has given us education and background. The knowledge that we have, we think we can accomplish great things for the Lord. And we tend to go through our life trying to do those things in our own strength, our own might, in our own ability. Because we have them, and we believe that we are capable of doing it ourselves. Moses had to learn a lesson that he was not capable in and of himself. And as long as he thought he was, and as long as he believed that God was going to deliver him by his hands, which ultimately God was going to do, but he thought he could do it. God said, no, 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 this is not going to be about you, Moses. This is going to be about me. Continuing on. And the next day, verse 26, he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, sirs... Ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, 
where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were experienced, were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not believe. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. Now you see the difference. Moses, you thought you were going to deliver them. Now I've come to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is the Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you for your of your brethren, like unto me him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living, the lively oracles to give unto us. Eventually, God uses Moses. Moses yielded to God's ability. He said, oh no, God, I recognize now that you can do this. I can't. And God uses Moses, but it took time. You see, 40 years before, Moses wasn't ready. Now Moses was. God's timing is perfect. God keeps his promises. Just look at what he did with Abraham. Abraham didn't see the fulfillment of it, but God kept his promise. Moses wanted to uh, deliver the people on his timing. God said, you're not ready, Moses. I'm going to deliver them, but it's going to be in my timing. The Messiah is going to come. It's a promise. You may not see it in your lifetime. You may see it in your lifetime was the thought throughout the history of the nation until this point. And Stephen's point is, you have seen it. God kept his promise. God kept it in his timing. And you're saying, oh no, this couldn't have been the Messiah. The Messiah will be different. He'll set up a kingdom. He'll come in and he'll overthrow Rome. No, no, no. You misunderstand the promise. The promise has been made. The promise has been kept. And it was on God's timing. Just like he did with Abraham. Just like he did with Moses. But Stephen goes on to continue to explain a little bit more about the children of Israel and Moses. He says there in verse 40, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, what not is become of him? This is there as Moses is up in the mountain. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O house of Israel. Have ye offered me to slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephahim, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. When they had the tabernacle that God had promised, they went the wrong way, and they didn't worship God the way they were supposed to. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the Lord of Jacob. But Solomon built an house. Howbeit, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, saith he the prophet. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, of what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart ears? Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Here's the picture. When Moses built the tabernacle, you resisted. When Solomon builds the temple, you resisted. You try to put God into a small box, into your plans. It doesn't work. How long are you going to do this? You're doing just like your fathers and saying that Jesus could not have been God. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. You know the prophets, you haven't kept it. 
When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Over the next seven verses here, we see just kind of the summation of all of this. Stephen delivers his message. He challenges their hearts. He lets Scripture defend itself. But now we see a couple of lessons just in this moment after the message that Stephen has developed. First thing we see is here in verse 54. As they begin to gnash on him with their teeth. What a childlike act. What a terrible physical act. And Stephen is sitting there being chewed on. There is no limit to the depravity of sinful man. Sometimes... I'm almost blown away with how Christians today are shocked by some of the things that the world does. Why would we be shocked by it? There is no limit to the depravity of man. Now, certainly, we can show remorse. We can have that effect in our life of seeing sin prevailing that hurts our spirit. But we shouldn't be shocked by it. If they can begin to chew on Stephen... When just a chapter before his face was as the face of an angel? The depravity of man knows no limit. That is absolutely true in this day today. So you say, well, will the world continue to get better? No, it won't. The depravity of man will continue to become more and more pervasive until the Lord returns. But there will always be a remnant of those that believe and stand for what's right. And revival can come in waves and areas. But as a whole, society will keep running from God. We know this. We shouldn't be surprised by it because there is no limit to the depravity of man. Now, the next few verses we're going to come back to in just a minute. We're going to read through them now, but we're going to look at lessons from them in just a minute. But I want to see the opposite side of the fact that there's no limit to the depravity of man. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Verse 54, we see there is no limit to the depravity of man. Verse 60, we see there is no limit to the grace the righteous can show. How do you after being chewed on by people, drug violently out of the city, cast into a place where you begin to be stoned, and you're being pelted by rocks. How do you get down on your knees, look up to heaven, and say, Lord, don't lay this to their charge. They don't deserve the punishment for what they are doing to me. Well, they absolutely did. But Stephen is so gracious, what he wants for them, more than justice for himself, is he wants grace for them. He wants them to come to a place to where they accept Christ. That's his ultimate desire. There is no limit to the grace that a believer can show during difficulty. If when difficulties come, we respond like the world and we respond with a lack of grace, it is an indication that there is a lack of spiritual maturity. Because here was Stephen full of the Holy Ghost, as he had been back when he was serving tables, as he was when he was showing signs and wonders, as he was when his face was that of an angel and they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Still he is. When we are full of the Holy Ghost, the grace that pours out of our life is uncanny. But let's go back and look at the, those verses again. Verse 55. We see being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked steadfastly up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand. That picture of Christ standing is a beautiful picture because we know he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But as he stands when he sees Stephen, it is as if he is welcoming home. Standing is a sign of respect. We see respect for the faithful. Stephen was being faithful even unto death. And as his moments on this earth are ending, he looks up to heaven, the glory of God where he's about to be in the presence of. And as he looks... Jesus stands, showing the respect 
and the admiration for what Stephen has been so faithful in doing, welcoming him into heaven. Oh, that we would be so faithful in our life that when the end of our life comes, that the respect for the faithful would be awaiting us in heaven. Continue, verse 56. And he said, Behold, I see heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He sees this moment in heaven, and no one else sees it. Everyone else gets angry. They react to this when he makes a statement. But the righteous see what others do not. When that moment comes near the end of life, it is so amazing. The individuals who walk faithfully with God, the grace that is shown to them, and just the way they kind of see things differently at the end. It is true, oftentimes. We use so much medicine nowadays when someone's coming near the end of their life to make sure they're not in pain. But in years gone by, there, there was times when you didn't have that medicine. And so often those who were spiritual at the end of their lives, they would begin to see just glimpses of heaven. And I believe that the Lord would begin to help open their eyes to see what was waiting for them to make that passing easier. And when you consider this moment, Stephen could see what others couldn't. He could see the glory of God even during the midst of his suffering. And this is such a beautiful point. But as they're there, they lay their coats at the feet of the young man, Saul. We see Saul's hard heart. This passage helps us so much to understand a bit of who Saul was later down the road when he becomes Paul and he looks back on this time. But Saul, at this moment, he is in the midst of this terrible event, this unjust event. And he's completely complicit in it. He is watching it unfold. Probably because of his position, he would have felt like he was not worthy. Or, and when I say the word worthy, he was not one who was lowly enough to throw stones. He was too high above that process of being the one who was throwing the stones. But in his place, here he is just watching it unfold, letting people destroy this just man. And he's watching. And he's okay with it. His heart is so hard. But we don't know if this moment begins to echo in his mind. We don't know if watching this and hearing Stephen as he declares, Lord, I give you my spirit. And as Stephen declares, don't hold this to their account. Maybe this is what begins to soften his heart. But at this moment, Saul's heart is so hard. But he makes the declaration and he looks up to heaven. And when he looks up into heaven, the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand, he asked the Lord to lay this to their charge. And the Bible tells us that he fell asleep. He dies. He just gives up the ghost. But at that moment, in all that Stephen is going through, we see that the worst the world can do cannot diminish the joy that heaven offers. In the midst of agonizing death, Stephen is full of joy. He looks to heaven and he recognizes, but a few moments of pain here and all eternity awaits. What a glimpse we get in all oh, that our hearts would be so set on heaven. Our affections would be above so that no matter what this world throws at us, it never steals the joy that heaven offers. It doesn't even begin to diminish it. We just live in the fullness of the fact that heaven awaits, my time here on earth is short regardless of my age, and that one day it will be worth it all. Oh, the joy of heaven. Stephen passes into eternity. Christ is waiting for him. And the work of God continues on earth. And this event begins to change things. And we'll see next week how Saul becomes that great instrument in which God is going to use him to begin to change. As we come to a time of prayer, let's be sure to be in uh, memory of praying for all of those in our church who have gone through a great deal physically. Uh, we have had quite a, a rough week a week or two ago, uh, just with some of the elderly folks in our midst. Uh, Betty Hamby fell, broke her hip and her femur. Uh, we had also 
Uh, Brother Lovett break some bones in his back. Uh, we had Neil Holstrom break his ribs. And so just be in prayer for each of those. Continue to be in prayer for Mike uh, there in the hospital. He is improving. His strength is getting better, but still the process of whether he has to go through the transplant or not. And even the prognosis long-term on the transplant is concerning. So just be in prayer for that whole situation and ask God to guide and direct. Let's pray. Father, we lift up to you the great needs in our church family, and we come knowing that you are capable and willing to answer. We ask that you would continue to help Mike there in the hospital as the prognosis is months and months of different events ahead for him. And so we pray that you would touch his body, heal the hole in his lungs. We ask that you would lift him up. We pray for the boys there in New York and their new adjustment to life. We ask you to pray, help the Lovitz. Uh, as Brother Rodney's back is recovering, for Brother Neil's ribs, for Miss Betty's hip, that, Lord, you would touch each of their bodies and physically strengthen them. There are so many other physical needs that we know of. We ask that you would fill us with a joy of heaven. Father, that we would not allow any of the things of this earth to diminish the joy that is set before us. God, I pray that you will help now preparing the hearts of our young people as we are working towards the missions trip. Father, provide financially as there is still a need there. But also, God, we ask that you would prepare hearts in San Salvador so that the gospel could take root and young people's lives could be changed. Father, I pray that you would change the lives of those of us that are going on the trip. Give us a burden for you that is greater than what we have known before. Lead us into truth. Guide us, Holy Spirit, we pray. It is because of Christ we ask it. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful evening.